A very good morning and welcome to Media Monitor, the show that monitors and evaluates media coverage of leading stories of the week and puts the media in the spotlight. I'm your host, Alicia Jali. We're live right here on the SABC News on Channel 404 for all local and all global news. In our lineup today, we start by discussing today's newspaper headlines and the coverage of the ongoing violence involving children being caught in the crossfire. We look at two female University of Pretoria students' picture that caused a racial outcry mocking domestic workers. We discuss the earthquake that shook South Africa. We also look at the shocking atrocities being conducted in Nigeria and also discuss the deadly Ebola virus. Now, to analyze media coverage of these stories, let's welcome Ms. Khadija Patel, the executive editor of Daily Vox, Mr. Matthew Waite, research manager at Media Tena, and Mr. Teboko Ditsejo. He's the CEO at Ditsejo Media. And joining us on the line, we welcome Nishan Bolton, a director at Ahmed Katrada Foundation, Mr. Steve Kroshaw, an advisor at Amnesty International, and lastly, Dr. Herman van Niekerk, a lecturer at the University of Johannesburg in the Department of Geology. Remember, you can call us to give us insight on the stories that you think deserve to be covered by the media, but we omitted on the following numbers, plus 2711, 714-6847, 714-6843, 714-6857. Share your views and comments on Twitter at SA Media Monitor and like our Facebook page, Media Monitor. A very, very good morning to you. Now, as usual, before we get into today's discussion on the stories that made headlines throughout the week, let's take a look at today's newspaper headlines panel. A very good morning to you, Khadija. Just want to say happy Women's Day for yesterday. Thank let's you Let's start much. with you. you. Thank you very much, Khadija. Let's start with you. What, what, what is in your headlines today? I think, um, you know, What's significant is that Women's Day really hasn't made much of an impact in uh, the Sunday papers, considering that we celebrated, we commemorated Women's Day yesterday. And it is an important, uh, you know, day in the South African calendar. If nothing else, for remembering the role or uh, uh, contribution of women in the struggle, but also, you know, uh, a chance to reflect on the struggles, the mm -hmm. continuing struggles of women in South Africa. And I think it's quite significant that, um, you know, that Women's Day does not feature very much more you know, more prominently, except perhaps for a picture of the ANC Women's League in the City Press, mm -hmm. uh, on the front page of the City Press. Besides that, I think that, oh, you know, what's got a lot of tongues wagging is the lead story in the Sunday Times and the City Press of a, um, a love affair between a uh, you know senior SARS official and a tobacco lawyer, mm. um, which seems to have serious implications on many important investigations. Mm. So that I think that is a story that perhaps you know um, you know will be talked about for a few days still. For some time, yeah, it's quite scandalous. Matthew, what tickles your fancy today? Um, I was struck by two stories actually. The, the the front page of the Sunday Independent, they've gone in a different direction from the love affair, and they're looking at the the Zim style plan mm -hmm. that they, as they call it, uh, regarding <laughs> mining ownership in South Africa. Um, the, the headline interests me because I think that any time you put something radical and Zim style on the headline, <laughs> it's going to sell papers. And I think um, you know, it's it's perhaps uh, uh, symptomatic of the way we look at the government at the moment. There seems to be a bit of uncertainty around what their policies are going to be. And I think that this is reflected in this story where, you know, the, the mining policy, are we, are we mm. looking at nationalization? Are we looking at, at um, some sort of a Zim style radical change in the country? And mm. I think that it speaks to a, a level of uncertainty that's being felt in certain perhaps in the business sector and more generally by society. And it, I found that quite interesting, mm. um, you know, as to whether the once people start analyzing these acts and, and legislations, whether they end up being as radical and as scary as we think, that's always up for debate. But it's, it's just interesting the way we frame these discussions. Very ah, often. very interesting. Can I, I just take the liberty to ask Matthew, do you think that it's significant that such a story coming out of the independent? Uh... <laughs> that is interesting. I mean, <laughs> the, the, uh, it's a discussion that we have internally at Workhouse, which is sort of, you know, do how do you how do you gauge the independence headlines now? Do, I mean, is there more involvement? And and we do wonder whether the, it's it's being more used in, in as a political tool these days, given yes. um, Iqbal Survey's prominence within the party, and, and and you know whether he falls down on one side or the other of, of factions. And it's it's possible, you know, maybe maybe we need to bear in mind the fact that they have gone in a completely different direction in terms of headline from the other two major Sunday papers. And Very maybe interesting that's that Khadija point. points that out because yeah. we tend to overlook sometimes how certain papers tend to report mm. on certain issues. And uh, Teboho, what, what is in your headlines this morning? I think uh, what's interesting is in the Sunday Times, page three, um, which, which talks about the U.S. presidential summit um, for African heads of states. I think that's highly significant because trade between the U.S. and Africa is at 980 billion um, mm -hmm. rands um, annually. 
um, that was in 2013. Mm -hmm. And they're competing with China, which is sitting at over 2 trillion um, rands worth of trade um, mm -hmm. with Africa annually. But I think touching on the issue of, of Women's uh, Day uh, yesterday and the fact that there's not much emphasis on it, I just it struck me that um, uh, the bulk of the conversation is about how women have been dressed um, mm -hmm. at the presidential summit <laughs> and not necessarily the, the policies which mm -hmm. are being um, discussed and the over $17 billion worth of investment which the U.S. is planning to bring in Africa. But again, I think it's very important for us to touch on, um, um, on that. All right. Yeah. You know what? I think we'll actually get some time to talk about that further later yeah. on. But in our breaking story for today now, the Minister of Health, Dr. Aaron Mozzaledi, identified hospitals in nine provinces that are ready to manage, prevent and control the introduction and spread of the Ebola virus in the country. Meanwhile, SADC member states agree that South Africa should be the center of excellence in Ebola laboratory diagnosis in the region. Let us take a look at this clip. The, the following hospital has been selected. It's not one because it will depend where, where a case is found within the country. So we have made sure that it must be nearer to the source as much as possible. In Limpopo, we have identified Pologuano Hospital. In Pumalanga, we bank hospital. In Gauti and Charlotte McRae and Steve Beagle hospitals. In Guazulu Natal is Addington Hospital. In Northwest is Clackstop Hospital. In Free State is Pelinomi Hospital. In Northern Cape, Kimbale Hospital. Eastern Cape, Freya Hospital in East London and Livingstone in Port Elizabeth. In Western Cape is Tigerberg Hospital. We are busy working on a plan to make sure that the hospitals have got personnel that is trained but also have got equipment where we're busy procuring it. Now I'd like to stress once again that the World Health Organization has just declared this an international emergency. Now, panel, this was supposed to be a, a later story, a story that we're going to do later, but now this is just breaking news. What are your views on how the media has covered this? Uh, let's start with you, Matthew. Well, I've actually been following it quite closely. It's, an, it's a topic that I found really interesting. And what I have been impressed by is the balanced way the media are looking at it. Mm. Um, it, it certainly, you wouldn't say that the South African media have been scaremongering. I think there's been a very balanced approach in terms of presenting the views of medical experts and highlighting the way the disease is transmitted. Mm. Um, but at the same time, I think there's still quite a lot of uncertainty in certain areas about whether South Africa is prepared and what you can do. I mean, I, I think where is, what was perhaps different when you saw the bird flu outbreak? Um, or it was swine flu when they installed all those monitors at the airport. And there was a real sort of feeling that they were on the lookout for this. This time around, there seems a bit of uncertainty about how they could track this at the, at, at the border. Can it be stopped? You know, would people be already in the country before it was found out? Mm -hmm. And I think that there has been a bit of... Um, there's certainly been criticism leveled at the governments in West Africa, Liberia and Sierra Leone in particular, have sort of been criticised in terms of their slow reaction. Yes. And I think that that's symptomatic of the fact that it's not normally a West African disease. This, these, the, the Ebola normally flares up in Central Africa where they as a result have very sort of fairly sophisticated um, institutions for dealing with um, mm. the Ebola virus but in West Africa that, that hasn't been there and there's been a lot of criticism there and I think South Africa is probably working hard to make sure that should any cases arrive here they're not open to the same criticism and I think the preparation has been reflected there. Mm. Now the general notion Khadija is that uh, media does not create a state of panic but you think that's the right way now that the World Health Organization has just de declared it an international emergency? I think that it's very important that um, the media doesn't feed into a culture of panic because people can be easily panicked, especially in a situation like this where people are not absolutely certain about the facts and how people can be infected by this. So yes, so the, uh, you know, the culture of panic is there and media can easily feed into it. That said, however, I think that, you know, that it's fair as well to criticize South African media for not um, paying more attention to the Ebola virus, considering uh, you know the uh, you know the outbreak as it is, considering as you say the World Health Organization has labelled it a global emergency, and more than that, considering that it is an, uh, you know a particularly African problem, and that we have not at all you know given it uh, you know the attention that it deserves. Um, you know we hardly have any original reporting coming out from you know from there. We know that ye just yesterday there were protests actually in um, in Liberia, um, you know among communities that the you know that were in, mm. yeah that you know where you know where you know who are struggling with the virus so you know this is um, you know this is something where we have fellow Africans um, you know 
uh, grappling with this disease and indeed uh, there is reaction to the disease and the fact that you know it doesn't really figure much in our you know in our social sort of social conscience says a lot about I think you know the greater South African um, news mentality at the moment. Mm, mm, mm. The war. I think there's there's a serious issue when it comes to reporting around stories um, within Africa uh, coming from South Africa, um, and you know it, it boils down to well, proximity because proximity has a has a huge impact on whether or not a story is newsworthy. But if it's in Africa, that the proximity is close enough for it to to hit home. Because if you look at where Ebola is prevalent in Sierra Leone, Liberia, if somebody travels with the Ebola from Sierra Leone to South Africa. That's probably the first time that we'll start to report about it. But we're not reporting about preventative measures that can be in place to ensure that we deal with such risks. Um, and, and I think I'm, I'm actually appalled by the manner in which the Ebola crisis has been, has been reported because this is in history, in the history of, of, of the disease. It's, this is the greatest outbreak. Mm. But you find one news story, I saw one in News 24, and it, it is not being reported as widely as, for an example, the Oscar Pistorius case. Mm. And it is a it's a great health risk that we need to be educated about because I'll echo the sentiments of my colleague who says that, um, do we know how you, how you uh, get Ebola? Mm -hmm. Do you know how do you acquire it? Um, do you know that um, there's no, no vac vaccine for Hold it? Hold that thought, uh, Dewoko. Let me take yeah. uh, Anonymous on the line. Anonymous, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us from Johannesburg. Yeah, morning. Morning. You, yes, I'm talking in case of Ebola. I'm one of the people who are working around Jovek. Ne? <laughs> there is a Ebola in Jovek. Ne? I can't tell you where and how, but one of the hospitals, two patients already have died. So people, they can't say, it, it is here, it's just so that the minister has to talk the truth. Mm. It mm. is here, it's existing, and it, it was there, and then people were exposed to this kind of a thing. Thank you so and much. And then yeah, they say people, they mustn't talk, they mustn't tell people. You know, it's, it's, it's nice to, 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 to put a, 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 a picture which is not the real thing because it's there in already there are patients in in two or three hospitals they are there some two of them from Nigeria have died and then the other hospitals are still treating it and people didn't know that it was Ebola they only realized after that so the minister must talk the truth must tell the people the truth. This has to be not a, a, a picture of trying to tell people that everything is, there's no equipment, there's nothing. It's not yet prepared. They were just frightened. They were trying to do, they were trying to organize some things for, for it. They are not yet ready. They must talk the truth. And they, they mustn't impress the Central Africa that in South Africa it's ready because everybody's going to flog there and they are not yet ready. Mm. Thank you so much, Anonymous, uh, for the, those shocking news out there. And I think, thank you so much for him for, for letting us know. Well, when we return, we're going to discuss the violence against children and the racial picture that was posted by two students of the University of Pretoria that caused a public outcry. You can join the conversation by calling us on plus two seven one one seven one four six eight four three seven one four six eight four seven seven one four six eight five seven and let us know which stories anywhere you are you feel were not adequately covered by the media. Share your views and comments on Twitter at SA Media Monitor as well as our Facebook page. We'll be back shortly after this. Zoom into Africa. This is Libya. The chairman of the General National Congress is Mr. Nouri Abu Samen. Libya got independent from Italy on 10 February in 1947. The population is more than 6 million people. One of Libya's major languages spoken is Arabic. Monetary unit, Libyan dinar.
Welcome back to Media Monitor. You can be part of our discussion by calling us and tweeting us. You can ask your questions too via our Twitter account at SA Media Monitor and our panel can hopefully give you some answers. Now in our next story, a three-year-old boy who was caught in the, in the crossfire in a shooting in Westbury, Johannesburg, has died in hospital. In another incident in Reicha Park, a partially burned body of a three-year-old boy has been found in a mine dump in Reicha Park. It is not yet officially confirmed whether it is the body of Kerben Lavon van Veik who went missing last week. Let's listen to this insert compiled by one of our producers, Malibu Homakut. Three-year-old Luke Tibes, who was on life support in hospital after being caught in the crossfire in a shooting in Westbury, has died. He's passed on. May soul rest in peace. But uh, I just want to clarify on the record that no machines were, were set, put off by the family or the parents. The family has allowed God to take its rightful place within Luke's life. And Luke has passed on. He's left our community and he's left his family. The family pleads with people who may know the perpetrators who are linked with this horrendous crime. I'm calling upon the communities to come forth with information, with statements. Please allow the law, assist the law to take its course. Let us make sure as a community this must never ever happen again in our lives as a community and in Westbury and in any other community in South Africa. Let us make sure every child is your child. Let us make sure we protect our children. Two people have been charged in connection with the shooting. The charge of attempted murder will now be changed to that of murder, meaning that suspect number one will be charged with murder. And uh, the second suspect, remember we have charged the second suspect for the possession of, of, um, of the firearm. And um, further investigation into this matter is still continuing. Now, this was one of the saddest stories this week. Do you think that media did justice to the story? Let's start with you, Matthew. It's a, it's it's a very difficult story to report on because it's, you know, that you always run the risk of, of, of going too sensationalist and emotive. Um, but I, I felt that it was, it, it was very well covered. I mean, in, in terms of they got the views of the, the provincial government very quickly. Um, and there was definitely a very strong response to the shooting. I mean, you know, it, it's, we hear about gang violence in South Africa quite a lot. And that is a story that is, is covered quite well um, in terms of understanding the, the, the implications and stuff. But when, when you get a, 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 an incident like this, which affects you know, a three-year-old boy, it, it, it really it changes the way you look mm. at, at the violence. Because it's not just people who've chosen this life killing one another. It's now a small boy who had no choice in the matter. And it, it, I think that the media did a pretty good job um, presenting the facts. Um, perhaps they could do a better job in terms of driving the discussion though, because mm -hmm. it seems as though we've got a very violent culture mm -hmm. and not enough is being done to, to turn us away from that. We're, we are a people, it's not only this incident, you see people killing each other over road rage incidences and, and um, you know, domestic violence is still a very big factor in South Africa. And I think perhaps the media could do more getting us to speak about these issues and sort of looking at ourselves as a country and saying, is this how we want to be? Mm, Khadija, this falls in the backdrop of Women's Month and, of course, uh, violence against women and children is one of the focal points during this time. What are your views? I think that, you know, um, this story, as I, and I agree with Matthew, has been handled quite well in the media in that we've seen, um, you, know, um, you know, the background of the family and, uh, you know, sort of we, we've been able to place the, uh, this incident in, in context. A humanitarian story. But, mm. but at the same time, I think that for many, many South Africans, gang violence is more readily associated with the Western Cape. Yes. And I think that this incident has, um, you know, I think shocked many people with the fact that it is a rea reality right here in Gauteng. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that perhaps this is something that, you know, uh, South African media, especially as, you know, as many national media is based here in Gauteng, to do a better job about covering um, the realities of gang violence in places like Westbury. And also, um, you know, not just, you know, not just the violence itself and all, not just the incidents of gangsterism, but also the underlying conditions that that lead to gangsterism. I think that you know it's very, very important for us to do that as well. That you know that, um, and I think this you know comes down to gain for media to not only be reactive, um, but also you know uh, you know actually be that voice on the ground to you know telling people stories, telling you know being the voice of the voiceless, so to speak. Mm, mm, mm. Deboko, what do you think? I think the media did a brilliant job in covering this particular story from the beginning. Um, <clears throat> there were 
up to speed with all of the facts and uh, also the fact that the alleged um, uh, suspect in the shooting um, was out on bail. Um, that information came out um, and it, it also goes to question our justice system to see um, who, who does uh, uh, qualify for bail and who should be allowed to go, 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 go back into society depending on uh, the, the crime that they've committed in the past. Um, I think moving forward, it's, it's, I think that, that particular area where it happened in Westbury uh, has been known for gangster violence for a long time. I've known about this since the, the, the 90s. Uh, so for the fact that we are only now, now that a, a young child has been, has been killed and who was brain dead um, this year, uh, this week, um, now we're covering it, it's, it's a bit of a problem. Um, I think moving forward, we need to look at um, going to, 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 to the areas and having discussions about it, giving them the voice. Because it's happening, this is a daily reality. In, in some of these, these, these areas, and we need more coverage and more in-depth co coverage um, mm. about this. In terms of research, Matthew, what have you uncovered in terms of media uh, covering, the, highlighting this evil trend of kids losing their lives, innocent lives, to, uh, to crime-related violence? Well, it's, it's interesting the way crime is reported. Um, you know, there, there's, there's two sides to the reporting, really, and, and we saw both in, in this particular story. First of all, the, the Gauteng provincial government did a fantastic job mm. communicating on the issue, and it, the, new, uh, the new premier, David McCrura, he, he's enjoyed a, a very positive uh, media profile since taking office, and he continued that in this story. He was very much front and centre. Mm. Um, I mean, you know, there's, there's obviously the, the follow-up question of will he be able to enact all that he promises, and... That remains to be seen. But in terms of his media profile, he's done a very good job communicating on the issues and being there. And in terms of that side of the, the reporting, that's always very good, covering the, the statistics alongside what the government is saying, what's, you know, what the plans and proposals are. And what we've also seen but here... But is PR just good enough, Matthew? Or media really needs to do the follow-up on those... I've got that list mm, of promises and yes. the issues, of course, that the residents raised to, to the Premier. Well, that is, that's, that's the other side of the reporting. It's the human, the human interest, the human aspect of the story. And here we've seen that. You know, this was a small boy and, and we've seen the images of, of, of him in his life flooding the media. And that, I think that's what's going to be... will, will sort of change the perception in terms of humanising crime and that's when we will start to see the media following it up more because now a year down the line they'll probably I'm sure someone will go back and interview the family mm -hmm. have you been in contact with the provincial government have things changed do you feel do you feel safer on the street and I think that's what will change the way we deal with crime is, is making it more of a human element um, in the way we report about it mm, thank you so much panel and let's wrap it there on that story and move on to our next story now a picture of two white female students of the University of Pretoria painted as black domestic workers and wearing their attire sparked an outrage on social media. Panel, let's start with you, Khadija. What did you make of this article? Um, I, I think that it's not just the article, but I think that the discussion that resulted from this picture appearing on social media is very, very significant. And I think mm -hmm. that it is a very important discussion for South Africans to have. Um, because I think that what emerged this week is that many South Africans don't understand why blackface is, uh, you know, wh why it is offensive, and more than that, why it is you're plain down racist. Yeah. So um, I think that, you know, that it has taken something like this once again, I have to say, for us, you know, to bring to the fore the fact that we are not always reconciled mm -hmm. as a South African people. And that I think that many of the discussions that weren't necessarily reflected in the news media as such, but were, you know, were sort of shepherded around social media by people like Osiyami Molefe, the writer in, uh, based in Cape Town, mm -hmm. you know, where, um, you know, you know, the the facts of blackface and you know the history of blackface and why it is racist you know we were you know were put forward and discussions were held and yes you know um, you know we had many South Africans also reacting saying I don't see why it's a pre you know what what you know what the big deal is it, and I, it was a private function yeah, as well yeah. um, but I uh, I think that you know that these are I think this you know that this uh, you know I think that that speaks to um, a need within South African society, and you know, this is where the media comes in, where we need to have treated symptoms. Yeah, <laughs> so to say. Yes. Thank you so much, Khadija. Well, let's now welcome on the line Mr. Nishan Balton, who is a director at the Ahmed Katrada Foundation. Nishan, a very good morning to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Good, good morning, and good morning to your panelists as well. Now, Nisham, racism still occurs in some universities and the media has been doing its best to report on this issue. But what other means can be executed to combat racism at such critical institutions of learning? 
Well, I, I think it must start off uh, within, within our schooling system in the first place. You know, a, a, a starting point would be the school curriculum. We don't, in our school curriculum, actually deal with issues of race. Um, we, we don't deal with the issues of, of, of our past, and, 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 and its racial legacies. Um, with the result is that children in this post apartheid South Africa, in a post-group area context as well, um, actually um, come into our class, into, into the classrooms, not knowing, no, not knowing their history, not knowing the past of the country, then taking on behaviors that they would learn from home and elsewhere, and, 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 and reinforce stereotypes of people without knowing the full consequences of, of, of their particular actions. At universities, you have a number of universities that have very small units dealing with issues of, of racism and diversity, but those are small units within a, in a vast universities like but you will have the Center for Diversity Studies, um, and the same with the Mandela University and PE and so forth. Mm. But they would tend to attract small numbers of students to their specialized courses. What you really need is for, for a, a much more wider university approach to tackling issues of racism um, and mainstreaming it across many of the subject areas where, where it is possible. Nishan, before I let you go, who should be really responsible for bringing justice as well as attention to this matter, the Department of Education or media? How can this be achieved? I, I don't think it's either one of, of, of the two. I, I think this is a societal issue. Um, which requires the attention of, of really all sectors of society. You know, South Africa has had a responsibility to develop a national action plan to combat racism after the World Conference on Racism in 2001. We are probably only nearing the, the completion of the first draft of that as we speak now. And that really goes to, 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 to indicate how serious or, or the lack of seriousness that, that we have attached to this particular issue as a country. All right, thank you so much. Uh, that's Nishan Bolton with us on the line, shading some light into the recent picture uh, by two PU students that caused national outcry. Debo, let's hear your views. Well, I think um, we can't necessarily just blame the education system. Um, but if we do delve into the education system, then the importance would be to teach history. Mm -hmm. um, people need to know uh, where they come from, how did the world end up the way it is. And perhaps if you have more knowledge about that, you'll be less uh, susceptible to being stereotyped based on somebody's melanin. Um, the, the reporting has been brilliant. I think it's quite unfortunate that it's students that we're reporting on. Because um, as a student, you, you do make one or two mistakes, you know, um, when you're in college, uh, for your life to be put out there is something new because of social media. Mm. Um, but I think it's very important that we do teach these uh, students a lesson, but let's not expel them out of our lives. Mm. This should be an opportunity for us to educate the public about uh, the, the, the importance um, mm. of of being um, racially tolerant mm. and also tolerant in terms of our, dif our differences. But I think it raises the point, and I think we need to discuss this, is that we are losing the battle against racism mm. currently. Mm. Now we need to look at how are we going to um, resolve this issue. And that's how we wrap it on that topic, unfortunately. And when we return, we're going to look at the media coverage of the 5.5 magnitude earthquake that hit South Africa. You can still be part of our discussion by expressing your views as to which stories you think should have been covered by the media by calling us on plus two seven one one seven one four six eight four three six eight four seven and six eight five seven. Share your views and comments on Twitter at SA Media Monetize as well as on Facebook. Stay with us. This is Media Monitor. Technology is all around us and is improving lives across Africa, like how young Nigerians are connecting to the internet. There are doctors finding new ways to save lives in Cameroon, and the South African public transport system that is now getting Wi-Fi. We have gadgets, apps and loads more, some of which play a big role in Africa's growth. A huge part of this African growth is technological innovation. 
To find out a bit more about social media and technology news from here in Africa and abroad, join Ms. Pumele Lezondi every Sunday at 7.30 p.m. on SABC News. Welcome back to Media Monitor. You can still be part of our discussion by calling us on the numbers that will appear at the bottom of your screens or contact us on Facebook or on Twitter. Kondile from Mangawong, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. Your comment, please. Morning, Alicia. Good morning, Look, Kondile. Alicia, for me, the, the, the pictures that you have seen are just a tip of an iceberg of the intensity of the, you know, such activities, particularly in institutions of higher learning. If you can look at, for example, at the report that was issued out by Human Rights Commission at Dr. Phil June High School, where the report is saying, yes, there is racism, but there's a match by uh, black uh, learners that says, no, 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 there's no racism in our school, we never consulted. It talks to the intensity of racism and its complexity. Now, what it means is that there's got to be a lot of work that is being done. And for me, uh, uh, Alicia, this thing will never come right for as long as there are economic imbalances. Because for me, it boils down to affordability, materialism. And, uh, and uh, I think you, one of your panelists there from uh, uh, Media, the gentleman with, uh, was saying, Matthew, yes. we, must continue, we must continue teaching our kids history, all of them, black and white, so that at least they have a the background of what is happening. And also, we should be able to use the platforms like social media properly, because those are the platforms that we can use to inculcate the history of our country. Mm. Andela, thank you so much for your comment there. But panel, just before we delve into our next topic, are we afraid to deal with the, the real issue of racism? I think there's, there's a level of fear, and there's also a, a willing ignorance in certain parts. 20 there's, years into democracy. There, there's, mm. there's people who still s believe if they don't feel offended by something, no one else should. Mm. And I think that's unfair. It's not for me to decide that that picture was not offensive. It, you know, whether it does offend me or doesn't offend me, I personally did find it offensive, but I, I know the history of the minstrel performances from the Jim Crow South and what it means and what they were. So I understand the history of it and therefore I can see why it's offensive. Mm. But if you can't see why it's offensive, that's not... Look, they the found it end funny. Look, sorry, offended, Matthew. Yeah. Sorry, Matthew, but they found it very funny when German fans, uh, when the, Germany was playing against Ghana, and the German fans painted their faces black, and FIFA is still investigating. But everybody thought it was a joke. Well, those those fans are going to be banned by the German Federation. They won't be allowed to attend any more German football matches. And mm. I think that what we have to understand is that offence is offence. Whether if it's felt by someone else, if somebody else is offended, then you've offended them. And mm. and. Yeah. You know, whether it's a matter... I don't know the, the two girls. I'm sure they didn't intend to offend and, and upset people. But, and I think maybe what's necessary is, is as you said, educating people yeah. about the history, having discussions about diversity, not to expel them or kick them out of the institution, but to use this as an opportunity to create discussion. Thank and you. I think that's what's important. Thank you so much there, Penal. Well, there you have it, South Africa. Now, South Africans are still shaking after a 5.3 magnitude tremor hit Johannesburg and many parts of the country earlier this week. Now, the tremor damaged more than 400 homes in Orkney in the northwest where it was centred. Let's take a quick look at this insert compiled by Yolanda Mklati. According to reports, Tuesday's earthquake was the largest magnitude quake to strike the country in the past decade. Its cause is still unknown at this stage. Residents have started with rebuilding their homes. When I got off the taxi and saw the state of my house, I felt a lot of pain because it took me many years to build it. Northwest Premier Suprema Humabelo visited the area and spoke with the traumatized residents. We have asked the Department of Social Development to look at the people who will be helping us counseling the families that are affected. The Council for Geoscience says more tremors of the same magnitude can be expected in future. Well, on the line to give us expert insight on the story that made waves in the media this week, we welcome Dr. Herman van Nicker, a lecturer at the University of Johannesburg in the Department of Geology. Doctor, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, and thank you for allowing me to speak to the public. Now, Doctor, there seems to be an increase in the frequency of these tremors. What could be the reason for this? Should we really start to worry about our safety? And was this an earthquake or tremor? 
Well, first of all, you know, as far as we know, this is not an increase in the, you know, the frequency of these specific events. We have experienced them, you know, also over the last, you know, couple of years. And you must also remember that we've only been actually monitoring earthquakes in South Africa and sort of worldwide um, with scientific bases for less than 100 years. So we're not even sure exactly what the frequency of these are. But they are very rare in South Africa. And, you know, the last one we had in that area was around about 2005, and that didn't even really reach all the, the media and so forth. Um, we also you know, classify this as an earthquake because according to the definition that we use, a tremor is an event very similar, but, you know, caused by actions of humans, for instance, mining-induced seismicity and so forth. And in this case, we call it an earthquake because the processes that actually resulted in this event is, according to everything that we know at the moment, um, natural, and there's absolutely nothing that we can do about that. Now, Doctor, in your recent interview earlier this week, you mentioned that the African continent is slowly ripping apart. Briefly explain to us, what do you mean by the statement? Well, first of all, I just have to, to go back a little bit wider. Um, the processes that we see on Earth and everything, everything about the landforms that we see is controlled by a process that geologists call plate tectonics. And that is um, in very simple terms, that on the surface of the Earth, there's a whole lot of very thin-skinned plates that move around. And sometimes they collide with each other. Sometimes some of them get pulled in beneath others, like we see close to Japan. In some places, we form new Earth or oceanic crust along mid-oceanic spreading ridges. And in other places, the plate tectonic forces actually cause some of these continents or plates to slowly being broken apart to form new oceans. Now, this is actually happening at the moment, and it's been happening for around about the last 30 million years up in the northern part of Africa. And the, the, the southward extension of this one arm of the specific breakup event is what we call the East African Rift. And this is not something that is now, you know, just being thought up. This is a very, very now well-known feature. It was responsible for all of the formation of the, the Great Lakes in Africa, as well as the volcanoes like Kilimanjaro and so forth. And this is slowly trying to break open, you know, the African plate. And this is extending southwards around about 2.5 centimeters per year. And at the moment, its most southern extent is in northern Mozambique. Mm. Thank you so much, Doctor, for your time on the show this morning. Okay, that's a big pleasure. Thank you so much. That's Dr. You. Herman van Niekerk, a lecturer at the UJ's Department of Geology, with his expert advice on our recent tremor or earthquake, as he just pointed out, that did quite a lot of damage in Orkney. Now, panel, what are your views? This was a very exciting story. Where, was it, where were you when the earthquake hit, uh, Khadija? Did you feel it? <laughs> I, I was actually in Bramfontein, and I was on the phone, and um, it was quite an angry phone call. So at first, I wasn't sure whether it was me <laughs> shaking or the room shaking. <laughs> Um, but I think that, you know, coming back to what the doctor has just said, that yeah. I think it's quite significant that he said that a similar magnitude earthquake hit the same area a few years ago, and mm. it didn't hit the media. And I think that the difference this time is that people in Johannesburg felt it. Ah. Mm. And that it's because people in Johannesburg felt it that, you know, that, you know, the, you know, we've seen the, you know, we've seen the media coverage, we've seen the analysis, and we've seen, you know, um, you know, the public sort of information being relayed you know, or information relayed to the public from, you know, from the academics. Yes. I don't think this would have been the case if it was just an earthquake felt by Orkney only. Mm. Mm. Matthew? Well, I was going to say that this one, for me, the difference with this one, I think that this is one case where the traditional media lagged behind social media. Mm. I mean, I was at my office in Pretoria and we felt it there even. Mm. Um, but before my screen had stopped shaking, I got the first tweets and Facebook posts about it. <laughs> and I think that that drove a lot of the coverage as well. I mean, the, the media had to take notice because there was so much discussion mm. around what, what the earthquake was and, and all of that. that it, was just, it became a, a national conversation or, or at least a counting conversation about <laughs> about the earthquake and I think that drove media coverage to sort of have a look at what it was and what were the the causes and stuff. Look a man also died and I think uh, mm. the damage also that was was caused in Orkney has also like just blown this issue further. Debo? Yeah I think um, it's it's with issues such as earthquakes it's very important that they be reported. Firstly because there's an educational perspective that you have to um, show the public. Mm. Um, if it happens what should you do? I think that's very important for the public to know because um, if, it's not, if, it's not a, if it's not a tremor 
and it's, it's not man-made and it's, 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 it's natural, it's an earthquake, then there's nothing much you can do to avoid it. Mm. But there's something you can do if it happens in order to avoid injury, such as not going to the edges of the building, going into a wall inside the building because the edges are going to fall first if it's a major earthquake. And I think um, if, if it's only going to be reported in, when, when it hits Joburg a little bit, then that's a bit of an issue. I think we haven't seen an increase in earthquakes. We've just seen an increase in awareness, which makes you feel as if there's an increase, but there's no increase. Mm, mm. Is that true, Khadija? <laughs> you know, again, you know, I, I, we have to you know, go back to what the experts are saying regarding mm. the science of it um, and you know, the actual uh, frequency of these tremors and the earthquakes. And then you know, what we can then do in our jobs is then to see whether the media coverage is actually telling up with that increase. Mm, mm. But what is it going to take for media to put those precautionary measures out there? Because I think that's the least that they can do. They need to work with this geology department. Matthew? Well, it's, it's a difficult thing because, again, you don't want to go back to the, the issues Khadija raised earlier about mm. scaremongering. Um, yes. We're not a country that sees a dangerous level of earthquakes. So, you know, if you look at somewhere like Japan, for example, yeah. they have so many that it's sort of something they're taught in school, how to deal with an earthquake. For us, we're probably uh, you know, far less informed. I know for me at our office, we didn't know what to do. We've got a fire <laughs> drill rule. We've got rules for all sorts of things. The earthquake happened. We all just sat around looking at each other. <laughs> and, you know, perhaps there could be a greater, a, a little bit of awareness around that. But yes. at the same time, you don't want to flood people, people and sort of get people every time a door slams. I think it's an earthquake. And I'd rather be safe than sorry, Matthew. <laughs> but anyway, stay tuned because when we return, we're going to be discussing the coverage of the barbaric killings in Nigeria as well as the Ebola virus. If we still have time, you can still call us on plus 2711 7146847 7146843 7146857 Share your views and comments on Twitter at SA Media Monitor as well as on Facebook. Don't go anywhere. Welcome to our Friday edition of A View from the House, coming to you live from Parliament. My name is Asanda Mbeche. President Jacob Zuma officially opened the National House of Traditional Leaders and calls on traditional leaders to work closely with elected public representatives. South Africa is a much better place to live in than it was before 1994. Many of our traditional leaders can attest to that fact having seen improvements. A view from the house weekdays at 2.30 on SABC News. Welcome back to Media Monitor. You can still be part of our discussion by contacting us on the numbers that will appear at the bottom of your screens, not forgetting Facebook as well as Twitter. In our next story now, a gruesome video depicting Nigerian soldiers slaughtering Boko Haram members was released by human rights group Amnesty International. Panel, once again, someone said that media grows fatigued by the same story. Since 2009, lots of people have died because of Boko Haram. Why are we not still getting groundbreaking journalism? Khadija. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think that, um, you know, for us in South Africa, and we have to always talk about South Africa first before we address the global media. And I think that, um, again, an African story isn't getting as much attention in South Africa as it should be getting. Mm -hmm. That if South Africa wants to continue calling itself the gateway to Africa, then we have to start considering stories of African importance more. Mm -hmm. And that Boko Haram isn't, you know, isn't, you know, isn't just a sudden, um, you know, a sudden pop-up. Um, they didn't pop up out of nowhere, kidnap 200 girls and then disappear. Because that, you know, if, if we look at sort of the outrage or, or the coverage, the level of the coverage that we've seen in, or the level of awareness indeed that we've seen in South Africa on this story, then, you know, you'd almost believe that that is the case. However, as you've pointed out, that, you know, that this has been going on for a number of years. And um, if anything, I think that, you know, atrocities have been committed on both sides here. That... Um, Boko Haram have, you know, absolutely been terrorizing, you know, the, the north of Nigeria, areas of the north of Nigeria. But at the same time, you know, the Nigerian army's response has repeatedly been shown, um, you know, to, to, you know, actually be violating human rights mm. in many, many instances. So I think that and the only way that we can understand what's happening there better is to always also make sure that we are only, we are taking uh, or paying attention to what's happening, you know, consistently. All right. Deborah? 
Yeah, I think this is quite an unfortunate story. Um, 702 Eyewitness News did a, a great job um, in terms of the timing. They got the story out there very quickly mm -hmm. and they got the analysis out there on, spot on. Um, but generally with the rest of the media, most of the media, I think um, the reporting has, has, has left much to be desired. Mm. It's, 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 it's just unfortunate that, you know, as um, Khadija has said, that we call ourselves the gateway to Africa. But then we report stories as if um, we're not in the continent of Africa. Mm. And we need to start to um, report more about what is happening on the African continent and holding other African countries to account. Because sometimes it's very difficult if you're within a system mm. to tackle the system. But there are people outside of your system who can hold your system um, to account. And that is what we should be doing. Mm. Oh, and unfortunately, this is a warning that some of these visuals that you're actually seeing are actually not uh, suitable for the more sensitive viewers. But joining us to give us more insight on the video footage, we're now joined on the line by Steve Crosher, advisor at Amnesty uh, International. A very good morning to you, sir, and thank you for joining us. Good morning. Pleased to be with you. Now, Steve, Amnesty International says its mission has discovered that extrajudicial killings are common in conflict-torn Nigeria. Please elaborate further. What is this kind of killing? Well, it, it's truly horrific killing that we are, we are seeing. The um, video which you've already described, as you also said, is it, too horrific in a sense to, to show in it, its full detail publicly. But, for example, including the slitting of throats of people one by one, speaking personally, it's some of the worst stuff I have ever seen at all. We're obviously familiar with war crimes, but very, very terrible crimes. Um, and we see people waiting to be killed. They're lining, sitting there waiting to be killed, summoned forward, and then their throats are slit while alive, the bodies tossed into a grave. Simply from describing that now, you can see how terrible, terrible these things are. And what we have seen, uh, so what clearly, as one of your interviewees said a moment ago, the crimes committed by the Boko Haram group are truly terrible, and Amnesty International has repeatedly described those as crimes against humanity. Yeah. But see this by the Nigerian military, that's very disturbing indeed. But Steve, Boko Haram has also released videos of their shocking crimes. How does this now compare to this video of the military soldiers? And also we've heard reports that Boko Haram militants actually disguise as military soldiers when committing their crimes. Is this an ethical source? Has it been proven that it is actually military soldiers? Yeah, so I mean, as you say, there are indeed terrible crimes on, on the Boko Haram side, and I'm not going to try to, to make balances and in terms of the number of dead, the number of they have committed, truly terrible. But we're looking here at a, a government military and government militias and, and what they are doing. So to go to the heart of your question of, of do we know it's military, I would say the overwhelming body of evidence points in that direction. What we at Amnesty International are calling for is an independent investigation which truly gets to the bottom of this. It can't just be the military investigating itself again, which we've seen promises again and again and again, and nothing comes of those. So I was, in fact, part of a mission that Amnesty International did together with the Secretary General, the head of the global head of the organization in 2012. And again, there was a mixture, I would say, of denial and promising investigation. And that's exactly what we've seen now again. We had a press conference given by the Nigerian military where they, on the one hand, said this is very disturbing. And I think the word um, investigating was used. But fundamentally, the message was still, this can't be us. Mm -hmm. To give you just one example of why we, we have eyewitness accounts of what happened, we also have been receiving uh, from inside the establishment accounts because some are quite rightly very worried. Mm -hmm. um, but to give you a particular detail that was visible in, in one of the videos is the number on a rifle. That number ties it to a particular battalion, and we understand, again, from our inside sources, we understand that that rifle had not been reported as stolen. In other words, you can't just say, oh, this is Boko Haram dressing up as others. The mm. overwhelming body of evidence points in the, right, the other direction, and I think that's deeply shocking. And although I and thank you so much that SABC is, mm. is addressing this strongly, but I think it could hardly be more shocking that around the world there has been too little attention to these truly terrible crimes. Mm. Steve, thank you so much for your time and insight on the show this morning. All right, that Thank was... You.
That was Mr. Steve Croshaw, advisor at the Amnesty International, giving us insight on a video of military soldiers carrying out what could be suspected as extrajudicial killings of suspected Boko Haram insurgents. All right, we're going to take our very final ad break, and then when we come back, I'm going to read your tweets, and we'll also hear from our panel as to which stories they think will be making headlines this coming week. Share your views and comments still on Twitter at SA Media Monitor as well as on Facebook. Don't go anywhere. Zoom into Africa. This is Ghana. The president is Mr. John Dramani Mahama. Ghana got independent from the United Kingdom on 6 March in 1957. The population is more than 25 million people. One of Ghana's major languages spoken is English. Monetary unit is CD. Welcome back to Media Monitor. And this was where we get to read some of the tweets that some of our loyal viewers have, of course, sent to us on the topics that we've been discussing today. Let's look at some of those tweets. August Baby Pula says, uh, of course, uh, use of language is important too. Education in all languages, vernacular. Every country should be well informed and alert. Thank you so much. Shani Pillay says, yes, we as a public should be told what to do and how to prevent it. Also, what signs to look out for so that we don't make others sick? Shane Pile is in, uh, I think her comment is in relation to the Ebola outbreak. Thank you so much uh, for your comment there. Lena says exactly the more knowledge they, ha they are, uh, they have rather, they can prevent it or will help identify the symptoms of diseases at, at an early stage. Lena, thank you so much for your time. DMH says community of Reicha Park must take the law into their own hands. How long are they going to be uh, mourning the death of children? Ooh, all right. It's not advisable to incite uh, public violence there, DMH. Uh, but uh, Skumbuza says what drove these men to do such uh, uh, attempted murder charge has been converted. All right, Skumbuza. We can't really clearly make out what you're saying there, but Christian Marxist says the media turns a blind eye to the reality of racism and it still exists hard. Black people are still disadvantaged. Thank you very much uh, to all our viewers uh, for your tweets there. Panel, very quickly, let's start with you, Matthew, your top story this week. This week, I think we're going to see a lot of focus on the NPA. There continues to be a lot of fallout from there, and I think that it's going to drive headlines quite significantly this week. All right. Khadija? I'm looking forward to seeing how this, uh, you know, how this story with the, uh, with the SAS you know, senior official, uh, you know, plays out this week. I, mean, I think that, you know, it might be quite interesting. All right. I think um, the issue of the NPA and its top brass being charged uh, with perjury, I think that's going to be one of the main news stories. And, um, yeah, that's, that's going to be... Panel, yeah. thank you so much for your views this morning. All right, and our viewers' contributions and suggestions is highly valued. Remember, you can email us your views about the show at mediamonitor at sabc.co.za. Share your views and comments on Facebook. Go to www.facebook.com forward slash mediamonitor and like our page. You can also follow us on Twitter at SA Media Monitor. Thank you so much for watching Media Monitor today. Join us again next week, and in case you missed our live show, remember, you can still catch a repeat on Monday morning at 2 a.m. from myself, Alicia Jolly, and the rest of the Q-Tip team. Have a blessed Sunday and to all the women out there, we hope that you had a fabulous Women's Day. Goodbye.